Jean-Claude Trichet, thank you very much for joining us. So a momentous day as the UK officially triggers Article 50 to begin the two-year Brexit negotiations. What would you expect the relationship between the UK and the EU to look like once these negotiations are done? Well, we, we will see, of course, that that depends very, very much on the United Kingdom on the one hand and uh, of the capacity to engage in, uh, I would say, as uh, uh, rational as possible negotiation, because uh, what is uh, very, very damaging, I would say, for both the European economy and also for the world economy, is the uncertainty on what will be the final uh, deal between uh, both, I would say, entities. So I hope very much that uh, the thing will go as rapidly as possible, certainly within the two years, and uh, that we will clarify the situation very, very soon. Of course, I regret very much, I have to say, that the hard Brexit has been chosen by the uh, British side. I think it's a mistake. It's a mistake for uh, uh, the United Kingdom and certainly uh, uh, bad for, uh, I would say, the European and global economy. But that's life. A uh, decision has been taken. The, British government took its decision, and of course, we have to see now what is going on. How concerned are you that other countries, that, that the UK won't be the last country to do this, that in over the next several years, another country in the EU will follow suit? No, I must confess, I don't expect that personally. Uh, I uh, think that it is an illusion which uh, is very often uh, shared in London that uh, it's only the first of a sequence of uh, exit. I don't think that at all. I think that, uh, and it's very important to understand that uh, from London and also from New York and Washington, that we are in a universe where the, I would say, experience of continental Europe, the historical experience of continental Europe uh, renders uh, the overall European Union much more solid and much more resilient than is suspected. We could see that in the worst financial crisis ever since World War II, where, as you know, uh, the uh, euro, for instance, and the euro area proved much more resilient than was expected. It is because you have to price in the historical experience and the uh, knowledge that the European have, at least the continental European have, that their union is a key, I would say, condition for stability, for price, for, for peace, and also for prosperity. So you would say, and I've heard others argue this too, that the media in London, the media in the United States, pundits uh, who are not on the, not part of continental Europe, don't really appreciate the desire to maintain the EU, and it's sort of a, there's this misconception out there. Yes, I really think so, you know, and I could experience that myself uh, as president of the ECB. Uh, I could see the skepticism which was uh, generalized in, uh, in uh, the Anglo-Saxon world to oversimplify, and uh, because it was extremely difficult for them to price in, again, this, uh, I would say, historical strategic endeavor. And uh, when, uh, you know, after having bet on uh, the fact that Greece would leave and uh, that perhaps Germany would take advantage of uh, the exit of Greece uh, to also exit from the, from the euro, they realized that the people themselves, you know, the public opinion at large, was overwhelmingly attached to the union and to the euro in that particular case. Nonetheless, we have seen a phenomenon uh, across Europe in which s parties that are on the center right or the center left have seen their popularity fade sometimes to what we would call nationalists or populists, sometimes to the far left. In your view, what do the sort of current crop of EU leaders need to do to regain or improve their credibility among the public? Well, f first of all, I think you're absolutely right. We are the witness of a phenomenon which is very, very impressive. My understanding it's, uh, is that it is a phenomenon that we observe in all advanced economies, in the US, in the UK, and of course, in uh, continental Europe. Uh, I, 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 I think that it is uh, largely linked 
to the rise of India, the rise of China, the rise of Brazil and Mexico, the rise of emerging, the emerging countries, which is, of course, an element of, uh, I would say, profound changes for the people and workers and employees in uh, the advanced economy. And on top of that, you have, of course, uh, the, I would say, advances of science and technology, which are also profoundly transforming the production processes and uh, all the industry uh, in the advanced economy. So there is an anxiety in all our countries, and this anxiety has been, you know, crystallizing in the UK with, ex with Brexit, in, uh, in uh, the US with uh, President Trump, and uh, exactly as you said, in the extreme uh, positions that we see, uh, either extreme right or extreme left in, in Europe. It is the same phenomenon, I understand. And of course, we have to take into account that anxiety as a real, real political issue. And I, I think that uh, the, uh, I would say, uh, elite in all the advanced economy has to understand fully. And when I say the elite, I mean the elite of all sensitivities, all political sensitivities, right. in order to accept that this is a real problem and that we have to you know, engage in training, retraining, appropriate protections, appropriate education, and so forth, to cope with this uh, anxiety, which is justified by this global phenomenon that we are observing. This, what you describe is very similar, as you said, to a lot of the debates here in the United States. People debate how much of it is economic, how much of it is cultural, whether it's related to immigration, refugees, uh, issues like that. So talk a little bit more about the specific things. You mentioned job retraining, but talk a little bit more about the specific things that the elite, as you put it, need to do to ameliorate some of this anxiety. And what's preventing it from happening so far? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, if in the debate in the United States uh, it is stressed that not only the economic uh, hardship or the economic uh, intensification of competition is uh, uh, one of the reasons for this phenomenon, but also other phenomena, like uh, the loss of national identity like the cultural, uh, I would right. say, uh, stress which is associated with uh, uh, mass immigration, uh, with uh, also the, uh, I would say, evolution of our societies in general. You know, the, the family, the families that are uh, dissolved uh, in, uh, in our societies. Uh, so it's, it's a multi-dimensional phenomenon. And I think that you have to take all into account. If you solve uh, I would say magnificently the economic problem, that doesn't mean that the loss of identity will not be a big problem too, or that the, uh, what I call the, the dissolution of the traditional family is not an additional element that is, uh, imposes a particular stress on our uh, society and on the most vulnerable part of our society. So uh, I, I, uh, I'm absolutely convinced, again, that it is a multidimensional right. phenomenon that we have to understand much better it emerges at the, the level of the uh, political decisions by our democracies. It's a wake-up call, a very strong wake-up call for taking very, very seriously this phenomenon again. And finally, we just have a few seconds left. As we undergo this period of change and stress and all the things that you describe that are sort of manifesting themselves in politics, who do you see as the new winners and losers of the, from these changes? Well, uh, we, we clearly had uh, amongst the, the potential losers, even if their standard of living were nevertheless augmenting, and I trust that in this respect, we probably are under assessing the uh, real growth of the real economy when I look you know, at uh, uh, the consumer surplus, which is implicit in uh, many of our new uh, uh, technologies, for instance, but, but clearly, the uh, winners are those who are very well educated and are uh, surfing, if I may, on the wave of technology, innovation, creativity. And the losers are clearly those who are less well educated and uh, whose uh, uh, skills uh, are uh, progressively obsolete because of the, again, competition and uh, of the technology advances. 
So we have to care particularly for those that are the losers. But again, the problem is larger. And I think that we have to reflect much more. And it is yet we are not in the domain of uh, economy and economists, but in the domain much more of uh, sociologists yeah. and philosophers, if I may, this question of the na national identity, the, the, the belonging to, to uh, you know, a solid identity, which perhaps in the United States, which is a land of immigration, is uh, uh, particularly at stake, of course, because, uh, because you need a very strong sentiment of what it is to be a US citizen. I would say we have the same issue in France. We are also a land of immigration. The uh, proportion of the French population, which uh, has parents or grandparents that are foreigners, is as large as in the US. And so the mm. idea that uh, a French citizen ha has to be defined uh, as an American citizen, as something which has nothing to do with ethnic origin or, uh, you know, uh, sensitivities or religion and so forth, but has to do with the sentiment that you belong to uh, citizenship with, which is uh, based upon the attachment to values and the attachment to uh, liberty, if I may. Equality and fraternity in our case mm -hmm. is something which is very, very important.